Hello and welcome back to the latest episode of the Bion podcast with myself Kate and I've got Roby and Emma with me as always and this week we are talking about which species should we save. Um, This is possibly the biggest one we've done in terms of a topic and definitely the most kind of abstract, um, just a bit more philosophical. We always bite off more than we can chew. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I think as we're coming towards the end of the series, I think we've really explored a lot of themes and this episode kind of ties some of that together. um, Because really what we're talking about is what is the aim of conservation? And I think that's something that we've asked ourselves in so many of the podcasts that we've said so far so are we trying to save every single individual animal alive or every single endangered species from extinction or are we just trying to retain ecosystem functioning and conserving ecosystems or the species most critical to those ecosystems and those kind of approaches might mean sacrificing some species because they occupy the same niche as another and we don't have the resources to save both or it's not necessary for the health of the ecosystem or something like that. And these are definitely some of the kind of toughest questions we ask ourselves in conservation. And they are questions that most conservationists probably wish we never needed to I hate thinking about them. It just ask. makes my head hurt. But yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is, <laughs> so we're doing it for you today. Um, but because of things like funding issues, time pressure, other resource limitations, and so many other challenges faced by the industry, including you know a coronavirus pandemic, these are the positions that we do find ourselves in. And so today we're going to explore whether we should be trying to save every animal, every species, and if not, which ones should we sacrifice or which one should we save? It's probably a bit more of a positive. It's, it's a really spin on hard it. thing because you're like you can't just walk into a zoo and say right, I want to save that one and that one and that one, but not that one. And it's it's I, oh, I always think that whenever mm. we talk about all some of these really really interesting conservation things like I will I'll bring up the night parrot later but me and Emma really like the we night we love parrot. the night parrot <laughs> we love the night parrot but at the same time now that I'm thinking about it I'm like actually why the night parrot <laughs> that doesn't matter <laughs> yeah it's but a I feel crisis, like it's anyway. almost it's flipping conservation and turning it almost towards a medical argument yeah because obviously in medicine they have to make decisions about who lives, who dies, most serious in- in injuries, age group, chance of recovery. And conservationists are being asked to do the same. They're being forced to decide which species live and which die. And like you mentioned, Kate, this is almost entirely due to a lack of funding, um, which doesn't sit quite right with me. The idea that we could save everything, but because we don't have enough money in the right place, we're having to choose what lives and what dies. I think that's the ga- I think that's the galling bit for me. It's not that we don't have enough money, because we do because Richard Branson's trying to go to space. It's just that it's in the wrong place. And I'm like, I mean, this is a complete tangent, but I have, I'd, as much as I, um, you know, I love space, because, you know, science, it's amazing. Part of me is like, well, that, come on, we could just do some animals down here, sort out the oceans, and then we'll go to the moon, it'll be fine. The moon will still be there, the oceans won't be. Yeah, exactly. Sort mm. out the planet that we're all living on first, maybe, <laughs> would be an idea. Um, I like the medical comparison because I think when you think about it in medical terms, it always seems like a really good idea. Like, of course, we um, prioritise the kind of most vulnerable and the most, the, the illest people. Like, of course we do that, but that's not how nature works. Nature kill off the vulnerable. They sacrifice them the for the good of the species. We don't, we don't do that. We're kind of the only species or one of the only species that really try to keep our sick and old alive for as long as possible, um, which obviously is you know, because we're in highly social and compassionate species, but it's it's not what how it happens in nature. But when you kind of hear the kind of medical prioritization of resources, it makes perfect sense. But when it comes to conservation, sometimes it it doesn't make sense. And it's the idea of the way it's spun in medical terms is always looking after the most vulnerable rather than sacrificing the healthy. <laughs> like you're not going to get as good medical treatment. Whereas in conservation, it's not a question of healthy and sick it's a question of just two species on their own but then i think we're almost we're looking at this from a medical perspective in conservation because there are some animals that definitely would have died i'm going to go on a bit of a rant about koalas later (laughs) um but like they wouldn't be here if it wasn't for humans intervening and wanting to conserve them whether it's for charismatic reasons or or various other ones it's almost like that medical thing of like we want to save everything yeah and also the hard thing is where do we draw our own lines 
kind of like morally and philosophically because it's all very well to say, oh, I could never choose between, you know, a tiger and a lion if I had to had to pick one to save. But, you know, if you go by the... If you, if you follow the line of thought that all life has value and therefore deserves to be saved, could you ever say, oh, I would pick the tiger over the beetle? I, I would. I would... If it was just a tiny black mm. beetle and it was a tiger, I'd say, right, I'm picking the tiger. But that's... And it's very easy to say that yeah. about an insect and an invertebrate, but we suddenly struggle much more when it comes to big vertebrates, in particular mammals. And isn't that a whole kind of speciesist divergence of our morals and ethics? And you know, and, and the, the captive versus endangered, or is is it only does it only have value because it's endangered? Should we just forget about everything that's abundant? It's a. Mm. Oh, it really hurts my head to think about it. You know. I think these are factors that really influence people's position are the kind of conservation station status, how endangered something is and how charismatic it is. I think they're probably the two biggest ones because we often feel like if something's critically endangered, we have this moral obligation to save it. And sometimes people, conservationists will say, actually, we're fighting a losing battle let them go extinct and use all that money and all those people and all those resources and fund that into saving this species that's got a chance because once something reaches a certain level of endangerment the chance of survival is so much smaller that you could pull everything into it and do absolutely everything you can to try and save it but it might not work and then you've lost all that money and all that time and all those resources that you could have put into something else that you could save so those are when it comes hard and I think the charismatic species also has a really big argument because people want to save like the cute fluffy animals that they love and so I think those are the two big things that really influence people's position do you know I, I just feel... want to say sorry go on sorry I just wanted to say quickly as well that when we say these are the con- the decisions people face it's not quite as mm-hmm. literal as elephant or rhino go <laughs> it's, it's not like thank god for that you're literally having to decide directly between two species especially two species kind of on the other side of the world but it can come down to should we take all the money that we're putting into that and put it somewhere else so it's not saying we're going to kill them all off or we're going to literally just let them go entirely but it is a reallocation of resources away from a species which is sort of inadvertently potentially not signing a death warrant, but kind of that kind of thing, letting them become more and more at risk. It's really interesting because I have I, I have that same dilemma dilemma with the vaquita. So me and Emma did, I think it was in season one, we did a whole, was it Zoology Ramblings? I think it was season we one, we did both. a whole episode. We did it on Ramblings as well, because why not? <laughs> on the vaquita, which is this tiny, tiny porpoise in Baja California. It's the only place it lives. It's the rarest cetacean in the world. There's like nine of them left. And they're going to go extinct. And... You know, if it was nine of nine of a long-lived reptile with weird parthenogenic capabilities like a Komodo dragon, maybe you'd still keep going and it's worth it because nine is enough. But with a, a you know a highly social mammal and a marine mammal, which you can't breed in captivity, it's done. That's it. There are still nine left, but the book is closed on the vaquita, I believe, as, at least. So I'm of the opinion that we should stop trying to save it and put it into, I don't know, larger baleen whales in the Baja California, which have more of an impact on the ecosystem. But at the same time, the flip side of that is a lot of species we don't know if it's our fault. So the night parrot, and we will talk about the night parrot more, I promise, but the night parrot, it's super, super rare. And you see them like once every 20 years. It's the holy grail of ornithology but no one knows is it rare because we're making it rare or is it just always been a really rare bird or maybe it was super abundant and it we're just catching the tail end of it because if you look at background extinction rates there must be so many species alive today which are declining and we are just Mm. popping in at the right time to catch the end of them and then they're going to go naturally and i think that's the thing as well it's like you don't know what will happen if they do go extinct i think that's something you'll never know of was it a keystone species and we never knew and suddenly it's gone and the whole ecosystem collapses um but i think like you were saying with the vaquita i think the mexican government have kind of made that decision now yeah um, so this was very very recently they previously the sea of cortez where the vaquita live um was kind of uh, a no-go fishing zone it was the last habitat where they live it was protected and now the mexican government have basically opened it up to fishing and it's there's nine left and by making that decision to open it up they're going to be caught in gill nets by fishermen and the illegal people who catch the totoaba there's more about that if you want to hear the other podcast um 
but they kind of made that decision i think with nine left they're like well they're gonna get more if they support fishermen's livelihoods than trying to save and do you do you agree with that because obviously if if i was in their position i still wouldn't open that area up to fishing but i think in their position i would make the same call of okay maybe we need to stop putting all this money into vaquita conservation and and put it into something else would you would you make do you think it's at the same stage would you make the same call I mean, I think I would if I was the Mexican government. If I was the people working who'd work for years on the vaquitas, you'd obviously want to fight till the very last one. But there was a, um, a really, it was like the largest program I've ever conducted to try and save a marine mammal, and it was called Vaquita CPR. And this was an attempt to take all the vaquita out of the area and keep them in like these pens until it was safe to put them back. And that failed because one died, it was stressful, and they realized you can't keep them in captivity. So I think when that failed, that was their last hope because we've talked about bison quite a lot. The entire population of European bison comes from 12 individuals, which doesn't seem like that's possible. So I think at the time that program was running, yes, they absolutely should have done it. But now I think it's too late for the vaquita, sadly, very sadly. And I I think the really hard thing is that we, we have to be able... Uh, in ourselves actually to make a distinction between species that's what i find the hardest how can you look at a vaquita and say no and how can you look at a black rhino and say yes that's what that's personally for me the hardest thing but i think actually moving forward as the biodiversity crisis gets worse and worse we actually do need to make those decisions i think well i think for it, what it comes down to and what we're really talking about is your approach to conservation and i think they, this conversation especially they kind of boil down to two main approaches so you've got your species specific conservation and your ecosystem specific conservation and species specific is kind of what we've been talking about and vaquita cpr is a great example of species specific conservation where your efforts are directed towards one species and protecting and conserving that one species Whereas ecosystem specific conservation are efforts more towards conserving an entire ecosystem or an entire area. So uh, the entire Maasai Mara or the Great Barrier Reef as a whole. And that encompasses all the species that live in it. And I think that's where these decisions become a little bit easier because you have to prioritise the ecosystem and the functioning of that ecosystem rather than... Because I agree, I don't think... I don't like the idea of saying yes to a rhino and no to a vaquita. It just seems harsh and personal and completely not my decision to make because, you know, it's like playing God Mm -hmm. um, and that's not our job. (laughs) Um, That's not what conservation should be. But when you think about what's best for the ecosystem and the kind of global ecosystem, it becomes a lot easier, I think. So I'm a really big advocate for ecosystem specific conservation and trying to conserve ecosystem function over specific species. But a kind of interesting um, gray area, I guess, in between the two, if you kind of picture them like a Venn diagram, are, Roby, your favorite, keystone species. And like, you know, I could really talk all day about ecosystem them. engineers as well. They kind of would fit in that little bit where conserving a beaver, you could have species specific conservation towards beavers, which would indirectly be ecosystem specific conservation because conserving the beaver cre- in engineers and helps conserve an entire habitat, which helps conserve other species. And the same with elephants. So in some ways, species specific conservation is great when you target species that benefit so many other species. But if they're kind of on their own, and I don't really know the kind of ecosystem role of a vaquita, but if then if the ecosystem can survive without them, it's it's a little bit more digestible for me to say, okay, I'm okay to let mm. them go. I don't want to because I believe in the intrinsic value of nature, but it's yeah, it's a it's easier put to swallow than losing something like a beaver or an elephant that changes the whole dynamic and puts other species at risk and it's interesting what we choose to what we choose to kind of not i don't want to say romanticize but what we choose to um give a lot of our attention to in that species specific conservation tends to be much more flaccid flashy tends to get much more money you know save the gorillas save the rhinos save the elephants um everyone says oh i want to go save the tigers not i want to go and save the gangetic plain which is where the tigers live and all the other animals in it isn't but at the end of the day, it's all very well saving the tigers. But if the tigers have got nowhere to go, what was the point in the first place? 
which is where I love I love that Venn diagram thing. You know, keystone species. You don't need to go to Masai Mara or Kazaranga National Park. You don't need to go there and say, right, we're going to have a team saving elephants. We're going to have a team saving rhinos. We're going to have a team saving tigers. We're going to do every single species. All you need to get is one. You need to get that one species in the right place in the right time, which holds up this ecosystem. And if you save one, then they'll, it'll, it's the umbrella. They'll just, it'll do it all for you. And it's energy saving and money saving and resource saving. And we saw that in Yellowstone, you know, before the wolves came back, you could have gone to Yellowstone. And if you took a species specific approach, you'd have gone, okay, we need to someone to do elk. We need to do the bears. We need to get the, get the, um, you know, what are they, God, what are they, oh my God. <laughs> mountain lions, pumas. We need to get the mountain lions back from the thingy. We need to get this in. We need to move that in. We need to chop the trees down. We need to manage this. And actually, all it took was with one species, right? Chuck a load of wolves in. And it does it itself. Mm, definitely. And you save all that money and you save the time. And so Yellowstone kind of regenerated itself, really. All we needed to do was chuck a big dogs in. Yeah, I, that's such a good point. And I think what you said at the beginning is also like really worth highlighting about how sometimes species specific conservation is the, the flashy side of it i think that is one of a really big pro of it because i don't think it's all bad and it definitely has its place even beyond kind of keystone mm, species and ecosystem engineers and i think one of the things it does better than much better than ecosystem specific is bring in loads of attention um and mm. therefore funding from the public because people will get behind like a panda and people will get behind a polar bear but people don't really get behind like rising sea levels it's not that you're not like woo yeah i'm gonna just like slow that down mm. whereas seeing a polar bear on its ice cap you're like right i want to save the polar bears but what you're actually doing is i want to stop i want to halt climate change in its tracks by saving polar bears that's what you're trying to do because you're trying to conserve their habitat and that's where your money's going. Mm. Your money's going to try and halt the, <laughs> to try and maintain their habitat and stop sea ice melt. But you're giving that money because you want to save the polar bear because you think polar bears are awesome. And I think that's something that species specific campaigns, especially, are invaluable to conservation because they bring in so much more attention. Because I think this is kind of one question I had when I was researching this is, so the idea of flagship species, so they're not a keystone, they're not an ecosystem engineer, they can be pretty functionally useless, but say like the koala, for example. The um, panda. <laughs> koalas and pandas are great examples, yeah. but they're cute and they're fluffy and they can be on the front of these big campaigns. So say with um, the koala, there's so many reasons why they should be extinct. And I was actually looking on the WWF website and there's actually no listed benefits to koalas, like none at all. They, <laughs> they haven't even attempted to say there's any benefits to koalas. Oh, bless all them. All they say is that they serve as ambassadors for many other species which inhabit the Australian bush. So it's the idea of preserving the ecosystem of the Australian bush because it's cute and fluffy but they really, really should be extinct. Like their diet's so nutritionally poor, it's the equivalent of us eating cardboard. Um, their pouches God. are the wrong way round because their ancestors were these digging marsupials, so they didn't get soil in their pouch. So babies often just fall out because the pouches are the wrong way round. Um, they're riddled with chlamydia, so they often like have diarrhea, incontinence. Like there's so many reasons why koalas just should not exist today. But it's because they're cute and fluffy. So what do you guys think about the idea of using a really useless flagship species? <laughs> like, a, I feel really harsh to koalas. I love them. <laughs> but from an ecosystem perspective, like them and pandas, they're yeah. on loads of campaigns, but they don't actually do yeah. a whole lot for the ecosystem. <laughs> yeah, I mean... I, you always see these memes like climate change should hire whoever's doing the PR for pandas because like what is going on? They are the, they're literally the logo for one of the biggest and most famous organizations, conservation organizations in the world, which is the WWF. And WWF op operates in almost every corner of the globe. They're an incredible organization that everyone's heard of. And the panda has always been their logo, and the panda is essentially useless as well. Um, <laughs> no offense, pandas. Know? I think they're awesome. I'd love to go and see one. I'd love to go and see koalas as well, but they are functionally useless. I can give one good thing on a panda, though. Oh, go on. So there was this one paper. I, we may have read the same paper, which came out and looked at the impact of pandas on the, their ecosystem, and they found out that there was nothing. There was nothing. The ecosystem <laughs> wouldn't care if pandas wasn't there. But then. 
it said at the end of this quite funnily written paper, it said, we cannot dismiss, dismiss the panda though, because China has poured in 250 million pounds into a state of the art uh, facility for them in, I think it was Yichuan province, which I've is also that. housing uh, South China tigers now. So <laughs> the yeah. one good thing to say about pandas is that they help tigers. Well, that's, yeah. And I think to answer your question, Emma, I do think that having these flagship species is overall probably quite beneficial. It'd be interesting to run the numbers and say, actually, does the benefit of engaging people in conservation because people want to see a koala and see a panda and the benefit of conserving their habitat so people can see them, does that outweigh the money spent on their conservation, even though they're functionally useless? I think it'd be interesting to see that in kind of black and white numerical terms but I think just my opinion would be that I do think they still serve a really important purpose and to be honest anything that brings money and attention into conservation I'm I'm, I'm here for it um I but, like that I'm here for it <laughs> yeah <laughs> I don't I I don't I'd rather see that money be di- redirected to elephants tigers entire ecosystems um the amazon for crying out loud (laughs) the amazon needs our help um but i do think they still serve a really important role so there is another metric we can talk about about you know a metric for determining is it worth saving is it worth putting all the effort in and that's a metric called evolutionary distinctiveness or you know evolutionary uniqueness um so Mm. basically is it the only one of its kind? How long has it been split off from its ancestors? You know, how distinct is it within its family? Um, and there's a program called the Edge 25, which I think is, they've ranked the most endangered evolutionarily distinct organisms. So it's none of the big stuff. There's no tigers on there. Most of them aren't keystone species or ecosystem engineers, but you've got weird things like the Pondicherry shark, and the fantastic named Wondiwoy tree kangaroo, That's uh, whatever the, whatever that is, <laughs> um, and you've got weird harlequin frogs on there, and a strange sea cucumber, which is you know not seen the light of day for sixty million years, and there it's all the kind of the little weird things that if we prioritised ecosystems and species, they wouldn't make the cut, but if we prioritised how much we stand to lose if they go, they would they would make the list. And it's quite an interesting one because then that brings in the kind of, I think the night parrot would probably make it onto the list, finally. But I <laughs> quite like so that idea. That. <laughs> I quite like, you know, e- extinction is always happening. It's all around us. We're in the middle of another one, a mass extinction, which is probably, well, almost certainly our fault. And I quite like the idea of actually taking the time to pick out the little things that have actually made it this far. And, you know, the the Pondicherry shark is one of the most basal of all the sharks. It's, like, that big. It's been found twice. There's, like, one record in the Ganges and one in the Indus, and that's it. And surely we should, because we know nothing about it. I think. I think as well sometimes it's not... It's not necessarily about a whole species, and it's also... It's more about pockets of that species or areas Mm. i think sometimes you'll have a species especially a lot of species now as we talked about i think in our fortress conservation meaning of wild episode um so many species exist across such fragmented populations so you've got a few over here a few over there a few up there and sometimes you have to sacrifice a population rather Mm. than the entire species because they're going to be particularly vulnerable and climate change this is making is making it more and more obvious and there are so many studies coming out where they've looked at a species and it's the threat of climate change in terms of extinction and possible extinction to specific species and they find certain populations are extremely vulnerable to climate change and some are less vulnerable because they're more polewood or they're on higher ground or whatever it is and then it becomes okay do we try and move the ones in the really vulnerable place do we try and protect them there or do we just let them go and we focus on the ones that we've got and often the recommendation from science and from conservationists is to focus on the ones that are safer Mm. and let the ones in danger go and that's that's sometimes a bit more of an easier decision because you're not writing off the entire species but you could be writing off some evolutionary distinctiveness in that population or 
you know something else and it, it it's becoming this reality that we have to face that we might just end up losing some of this stuff the really good example but we don't of, want to the really good example of that which springs to mind is the south china tigers so before and this is again where my favorite phylogeny and taxonomy comes in and it is important uh mm. basically south china tigers are okay whether or not they're a distinct subspecies is kind of irrelevant in this case Actually, maybe it is quite relevant. Basically, of all the different populations of tigers, South China tigers are extinct in the wild. They're gone. There's none left. They only exist in captivity, and there's a group of them being rewilded in South Africa for release into the wild. Some people say they're a distinct subspecies. Some people say they're just a really old population of mainland tigers. Now, the South China tiger program is trying to rewild them in South Africa and then put them back into South China. And, you know, on the face of it, it sounds like a great idea. But actually, this is quite an unpopular program amongst tiger conservationists in particular, who are saying, what's the point? They're gone. We have plenty, well, I say plenty, we have wild breeding Bengal tigers. Same niche, same cat. Maybe they're a bit more derived. They've got less unique evolutionary adaptations, but we can just pop them over. Why spend all that money shipping tigers to South Africa rewilding them and putting them back in when we have a substitute and it's a really this is a this is a this is an example which really kind of gets me conflicted because there's nothing i'd like to do more than gather up all the south china tigers rewild them and chuck them back to south china great i would have a have a field day i'd feel like my life's work was well spent but actually what if the better thing to do here is to let the south china tiger go and actually grab a load of bengal tigers maybe from a park where they're doing well and they're going out of the park and there's conflict with villagers and now something's got to be done and actually you move them there and it's, you save a lot of money, you save a lot of time, you save a lot of resources and then you can go on to the next thing. What do you guys think? Yeah, I I feel really conflicted about that as well because it, it made me think of the, the northern white rhino and mm. the embryos that they're creating. of a f they're, It's an extinct species, really, the northern white rhino subspecies that's extinct because... The only two surviving individuals are both women, so it's functionally extinct. And both females, not women. Sorry, <laughs> we love a strong, female. independent rider. <laughs> um, and they've spent all this money and time preserving the embryos to possibly impregnate southern white rhinos and bring the species back. And that's incredible technology, and it's incredibly valuable. It's so much money, valuable. Though. Yeah so much money and you think there are three current critically endangered species of rhino and all five species are endangered to some extent and so should that money not go to trying to preserve the rhinos we have left in the wild and it, it but then the flip side of it makes me think actually is it worth spending the money on this technology now because then we have it for possible use on other species in the future and it'll be cheaper do you know, that's not about... I hadn't actually thought about that. And now that you mention it, the way the Sumatran and the Javan rhinos are going, it might be damn handy five years yeah. down. I was about to say ten years down the line, but it might not even be that. That said, Javan rhinos are thought to be increasing. But, you know... Fingers crossed. Fingers but it's crossed. hard. It is hard because you do think, well, you've got, you've got some left. Like, should we kind of focus on them? But then I agree with you. I'd love to see nothing more than the South China tiger come back and the Northern White Rhino come back and... If we could bring them back, we could help rewild the entire ecosystem. But it, we don't want to do that at the detriment of losing more. We don't want... And it's very reactive. It's very reactive conservation. Instead of being proactive, you're reacting to an extinction event and saying, oh my gosh, it's here. Let's do everything we can to stop it. Rather than being proactive in the kind of near threatened to, to endangered slash critically endangered camp and kind of think... Let's be proactive here and stop them getting to the point where we have to bring them all into captivity or breed them in a petri dish, ship them all off to a continent, another continent. Mm -hmm. Like that's so reactive. It also, it also, and this is where I am. I am going to stab myself in the heart here. It does bring up one of the shortfalls in kind of obsessing over phylogeny and taxonomy. Because what's in a subspecies? Really, what is in a subspecies? The northern white rhino and the southern white rhino are basically the same. There's no difference between them other than the fact that because they've been separate, their genes haven't crossed over. They're, one of them isn't flying and the other one's got lasers. Like, they are both white rhinos. 
and the same the same kind of goes with the South China Tiger. With the South China Tiger, you could make an argument that it's because it's the, the the basal population, it might have some older genes. But again, how much value are we placing on these genes? A tiger is a tiger is a tiger. And I feel like the the white rhino might be in the same camp. Maybe I am wrong. I'm not an expert on either species, but it could just be a case of, oh, they're evolutionary distinct. But in what way and what is the value that we're placing on that? Because surely we could just take some of David Hume's white rhinos because he's got plenty to spare. Yep. Put them in John Hume, sorry, and, and put them in where the northern white rhino used to live. And then yeah. suddenly you'd have 10 and you wouldn't have to wait however many years they're going to wait. I, I remembered my point. Can I say it before I forget again? Because I'm awful. Um, So there's this really interesting paper. So this idea of really endangered species, like should we even bother if they're going to go extinct anyway? Um, But this idea of the fact that we're using charismatic species, possibly like the rhino, on all these advertising campaigns, lions, cheetahs also fall in the same category. It was really interesting. They were saying what this has done, it's created what's called a virtual population of these animals. So it's actually giving people the impression that there are a lot more of them than there actually are because they see them on these Mm. adverts all the time. And so then they're arguing that that takes the pressure off the urgency because say with lions, most people think they're fine when they're actually really, really struggling. Same with rhinos. I think a lot of people would know, but the fact that these advertising campaigns are just using them as the face of I don't know, a lot of their ads and posts, but there isn't actually money that is going into their conservation is very flawed um, because it was this whole point of we think there are more than there are because of the internet and social media. Does, and... does anyone remember that with rhinos, though? Do you remember when Sudan, the last male, died? I didn't re- I didn't realise rhinos were that bad at the time. Yeah. And I was just like, oh, yeah, rhinos are getting poached. That's a shame. And then it was like, oh, Sudan's died. Now there's only two. And I was like, wait, when did that happen? And I, I was, I was, yeah. I was genuinely like, hang on a second. There's rhinos everywhere. Yeah. And it was, and I'd, yeah, I'd never definitely. thought about that before. And I think it comes back as well to what you said about taxonomy. Is that there's a there's a really interesting debate within the scientific literature and the industry as a whole on taxonomy's place in conservation mm. and how much how much emphasis we should put on taxonomy because sometimes it can be such a help and sometimes it can be such a hindrance and this kind of division of species and subspecies especially because like you say what is in a subspecies and I think your point Emma as well that isn't communicated well to the public I don't think it's not something that science communication has learned taxonomy so, sorry, the communication of taxonomy is not done well, I don't think. Mm-hmm. I don't think unless you... I don't really understand taxonomy, I'm going to be honest. I only understand I, it because of Rovi. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> it's all I ever I, damn talk about. I know enough about it, like I know what it is and what it means, but I it's very complicated and it's very convoluted and it's very intense and it's very specialised. And so you do have to really study it to kind of get a reasonable grasp on it. And I think... That's probably why it's not communicated very well. People just can't be bothered to give up. But then people get confused because, yeah, suddenly northern rhinos have gone, ex- northern white rhinos have gone extinct. People are like, oh, but there's loads of other rhinos. So what? What's going on? I thought rhinos were okay. And it's like, well, no, this they've gone extinct in this area, and that's a whole subspecies. And it's very confusing as to what that actually means, um, and whether it means anything at all. The general public, I bet you, if you stop someone on the street, they wouldn't even know that there's more than one species of rhino. I mean, maybe that's me assuming a lot, but I think as conservationists, we know that they're with rhinos particularly, that they're all these different subspecies and how they're doing. But rhinos are just always lumped into this one big category. And with that thing of virtual population, if they're all in one big category and they're always on advertising campaigns, like with the case of Sudan, I can't, you think they're all right. Um, so yeah, I do, I do agree with that point. I think taxonomy should come in more when it comes to rhinos and all the other species aren't just one big group there's lots of them and we need to care about all of them <laughs> and at the same at the same time there is a there is a place for it because uh, then going back to the tigers it's actually you know it, it, it would really inform strategy so we used to think there were nine subspecies which means oh christ we've got nine different fights to fight here and that's nine different pots of money 
and nine different teams and nine different habitats and nine different jurisdictions and nations you need to work with and yada 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 and then actually they came out and revised it and said look there's two there's the mainland ones and then there's the island ones and that really puts it into perspective because suddenly actually yeah uh, eight subspecies of tigers have just technically gone extinct even though they never existed in the first place but the other two are actually doing much better than they would have been in the last count so this really reframed and really changed the way we look at tiger conservation and actually since that revision of taxonomy came out bengal tigers have actually doubled in number because now they include all the old tigers we used to think were indo-chinese and malayan tigers i mean they are all decreasing but it it yeah it's interesting in the way that it does have a place to reframe the debate but i do agree completely we just get what is in a subspecies really <laughs> yeah and sometimes the the revision of taxonomy or the kind of decision to make a new species based on a revision of taxonomy is beneficial because you yeah. suddenly suddenly loads of funding sometimes it opens up funding doors because you've got this new species and people want to get excited about it so sometimes it can be really beneficial but sometimes it makes the situation seem it changes the way that the situation is perceived but not how the situation actually is so yeah you've suddenly got way more of this species because you've re you've reclassified it but the actual, nothing's actually changed mm. um you've still got the same number and sometimes it means that resources are split too thin because they're being split across so many different avenues rather than being diverted in a more kind of practical and sustainable way. Um, so I think taxonomy, the kind of debate around taxonomy in this discussion is complicated and very case specific in some yeah. in some cases. Um, <laughs> but sometimes I think it's a help and sometimes I think it's a hindrance. And it's interesting. I think maybe this is an interesting moment to bring in the night parrot properly. So to introduce the night parrot, me and Emma are very keen on it. It's this tiny little green parrot. It's like a budgie. It's like a tiny green budgie. What's lives in this Australia. When we're at uni and then you got you yeah. came into my room and you're like, Emma, 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 like, I need to tell you about the night parrot. I'm like, oh my goodness, yes. This sounds incredible. I was incredible. hooked. Yeah. I, I have fallen <laughs> in love with the night parrot. Basically, it's the holy grail for ornithologists. They're like, never seen. You. There's like one sighting every 20 years and it's one guy with a feather and he's like, this is from a night parrot. And everyone's like, really? And... You know, I, nothing would make me happier than if Biome went out and found the night parrot. And it would be amazing. <laughs> that would but be amazing. what would be the point? Because it's a tiny little parrot that exists at such low densities in the habit, in the environment that it's, it, can't, it can't have an impact on, it, on its habitat. The flip side of that is, well, because we can. And therefore we should. Mm. And, you know, we've put people on the moon. We've, we're sending people to Mars soon. We've got incredible wealth in our society. We've got more equality than anyone's ever had before. We've got more wealth than everyone's ever had before. You know, we've split the atom. Part of me is like, well, if we can do all that, we can damn well save the night parrot. And even, yeah. I don't know, maybe this is the contrarian in me, but there's so much evidence saying, forget about the night parrot, focus on beavers, because they're good for ecosystems. Part of me is like, no, we should do the, gram the night parrot, because we mm -hmm. can. And I think if we are the only species on, pla on planet Earth that has said, right, we're going to play God. We can at least remember the night parrot. But then I think it comes to, all comes down to where humans as a species decide to put their funding. Um, mm. There's very much more funding into kind of space exploration. And I mean, we've talked about this before. We're not going to touch on it because it's some people get touchy about it. But um, the Notre Dame, the rebuilding of the Notre Dame Dome Cathedral. Um, there is a lot of money there if people want to invest <laughs> their money in that. So that's what you're saying, Roby. Like, I think with the Night Parrot, if there was the will and the money, why not? Like, why shouldn't we, just for the sake of knowing what's there and knowing if it's out there, go look for it? But that would definitely be denied funding because there aren't enough of them. And also, yeah. they probably don't... I, I, this is the thing. We'd find it. We'd find the Night Parrot. We'd sit there, we'd look at it, and it would do nothing. <laughs> It would literally just be a bird, just sitting there, being a bird, and we'd be like, great, well, we found the night parrot. I would still die happy if we found the night parrot, but it's a, it's a question you've got to ask. The kind of, the optimist in me wants to say, oh, it's, the great thing about it is it's getting people engaged in nature and 
if people are going out because they want to tick it off their list, that's still good because it gets people out and about. But the pest and you know engaging in in wildlife. But the pessimist in for me is sort of like, well, what's the point in that if it doesn't benefit conservation? Um, and sometimes it you know if it's just to see it to tick it off a list, I'm a bit like, oh, you know, go okay, go get it, good for you, and that's your hobby and that's fine. But do you actually care about the well-being of the species and the well-being of the ecosystem it inhabits or are you doing it for your own just because you want i don't know it's just a bit like what's your motivation here why do you why do we want to go and see the night parrot is it just to say we've done it because it's so rare in the same way people love rare jewelry and most you know diamonds are only expensive because they're rare they're not the actual stone isn't just inherently expensive and it's the same with rare species we get really excited i always think this whenever i see a cat in the garden um this is probably a really weird insight into how my brain works but <laughs> when you see just a cat in the garden i remember specifically thinking this in cape town my flatmate had a cat and he was very agile and he would like slink and we had really um unmaintained garden and he would kind of move in around it and you would could barely see him and it was really cool to watch him but it's just ollie and then he'd come in and sit on your lap and i used to think if that was an african wildcat I would be losing my mind. I would be running to get my camera. I would be absolutely... This would be the most incredible sighting I've ever had. But because it's not, it's a domestic cat. It's very unexciting. And the same... The, the, you can get so close to a pigeon. And if that was a white-tailed sea eagle, you'd be absolutely blown away. And it's this weird... We do put so much excitement and emphasis on incredibly rare species because it's very exciting when you do find them. Because it's the sort of sense of achievement... But that's quite strange. Like, why do we do that? Just do you know, um, I had is I had exactly the same experience when we went and saw that red squirrel when we went to Mull, and I, I, we were sitting there and we weren't. We, well, we were walking through the forest. None of us expected. We weren't looking for red squirrels. I remember we were looking for pine martins, and we just suddenly saw this red squirrel. And I remember my heart went, and I was like, Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! It's a red squirrel! Camera! Camera! Binos! Binos! Yeah, like all of us started squirrel. whispering. We were all uh, like, we were like looking up at every single tree be like where is it where is it where we is it? i know excited. and you know i have, must see a hundred gray squirrels on every walk i do in the woods and i don't bat yeah. an eyelid in fact i actively think oh gray squirrels they're gonna give away my position if i'm sneaking up on an interesting bird because they're always jumping in the leaf litter i really don't like them the amount of times i've been sneaking up on something i've had my position given away by like a pigeon or a grey squirrel. But that red squirrel, I was like, oh my god, I'm seeing a red squirrel for the first time. And they might be willing to put up as well. Like, there were so many midges. It was so uncomfortable. <laughs> Bitten alive. Like, they were all around your head. Up your sleeves, trousers, everywhere. But it's it awful. was worth it. Because it was a red <laughs> <Yeah>. squirrel. <laughs> we didn't even discuss leaving. No. Like, we were like, well, we're obviously staying here for the rest of the day now <laughs> to try and see this red squirrel I feel like our again. cameraman Harry got a very good insight into how we operate. <laughs> Yeah. yeah this was day one there's an interesting Harry, thing but... though like you know an example that just popped into my mind is so you know the, the saola 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 the weird antelope that's been recently discovered oh, in vietnam vaguely yeah yeah I the asian you. unicorn they're calling yeah. it yeah yeah so it's really it's really cool that it's the first you know large mammal to be discovered in something like 60 years or no i don't even think it's that long i think it's like 40 years um but you never see it I don't know if anyone's ever actually seen it or if it's only just camera traps. Um, and so you might think, oh, this is a critically endangered species. We've got to start conserving it. But if you did, you'd probably fail because you'd never see it. But if you thought, oh, right, we've got to make a big national reserve here. We've got to get the community involved. We've got to save the whole forest. You would probably succeed, even if you never knew it, because you still wouldn't ever see the damn thing because it lives in the Vietnamese rainforest. But you'd still win. You'd still, you'd still succeed. Um, but I think we are seeing a bit of a shift, actually, from... I mean, obviously, there is still... People are wanting to conserve, like, species-specific um, kind of individuals. We're seeing that with advertising campaigns, still with elephants and rhinos. Um, but interestingly, um, the National Geographic actually conducted a survey where they asked people kind of which species would they save so this is the opinions of the general public and the most common answer on that was bees so really? it wasn't elephants it wasn't tigers whales polar bears so that was the other ones oh wow and so i'm wondering with this whole rewilding movement taking off and more awareness being raised about invertebrates and insects 
whether people are actually starting to flip and realise that maybe it's not the charismatic species that needs saving. I don't know, what do you guys think? With this whole rewilding movement, do you think that now people are more focused on like the habitats and keystone species rather than the big charismatic things? I would like to think there's more of an awareness growing, I think. You know, even even just random people I'd meet and talk to, most of them would understand that we need the bees. And I, I think that's more than I remember there being. And, you know, it, myself as well, I think I understand more now that actually we need to save the bees, not X, Y and Z. So I, I think I'd like to think that slowly there is a shift. Um, I mean, insect conservation, how do we bring that into which species should we say? Yeah. <laughs> All I, the bugs. I, <laughs> all the bugs, yes. yeah. I I agree. I think the I think the real world rewilding movement will have a really big impact on that as well as as you say in this kind of communication of an ecosystem approach over a species based approach because in the similar way we spoke about with in the fortress conservation episode when that's how they always did it was fortress conservation species conservation was a lot more common back in the day. Now we are moving more towards an ecosystem approach because we are more informed and it's a bit it's a bit more manageable in how things are now and it's sort of coming out that it's actually probably a better idea. Um, and that's just an evolution of, of our understanding and our kind of the industry. Um, and I think it is moving towards as well, giving more of a platform to things like bees and, and insects. Um, I think bees in particular, people are very aware of how, the role they play. Um, and bees existing has such a direct impact on people existing. Um, so that could also play a part that they are very tied to our own existence and our own livelihood. They are kind of one of the more bridging species between us and nature um, because we are very dependent on their and the, the function that they play in the ecosystem. But I think even on myself, I've seen a shift as I've grown up, and I think this is quite normal that when you're a kid who loves animals, you love mammals. And yeah. I definitely, that's how I got into it. That I just loved, I loved animals. And I would always say, oh, I love all animals. And I was fascinated by snakes and I I loved birds and I liked insects, but I, I loved mammals. Like that's what I always wanted to see. I always I wanted to go to Africa to see the elephants and I wanted to go to Asia to see the tigers. And when I was at the zoo, that was where I wanted to spend all my time was looking at the big mammals. And I'm still a bit like that, you know, I love rhinos. <laughs> and, um, I, I do love mammals. I, I do love big animals. Um, but I've definitely learned to appreciate reptiles and amphibians and insects more as I've gotten older. And I think it's a shift that individuals go through and kind of society is going through as well. So, yeah, interestingly, I was having a conversation with my dad today as well. And he was saying with the RSPB that there's now quite little funding that actually goes towards individual species so he was saying off the top of his head maybe turtle dove is the one that still gets species specific funding but most of it is now towards like wider species as a whole which would obviously include the preservation of things like wetlands um which is like the wwt the wetland wildfowl wetland trust is what they're doing it's much more of a focus on that and that is actually where their funding is going rather than species so it is a change within big organizations as well yeah i think as there's definitely i remember being told this when i was sort of studying and if you're thinking about projects and getting funding it, climate change projects research projects are so much funding is being thrown into climate change and if you're someone who wants to fund a project now more often than not you want to fund a project that's looking at climate change whether it be nature-based solutions in energy-based solutions or impacts consequences etc um solutions whatever it is there's a lot of money in climate change and then you can from a biology perspective or a zoology perspective go and go after that funding because you want to look at a particular species or a particular ecosystem in relation to climate change so it's it's as much it's i think a lot of funding is as you say going ecosystem based or just kind of concept based it will go to something as big as climate change and then you can go smaller within that um and obviously climate change makes sense because it's such a big thing Mm -hmm. so i guess maybe i don't know to wrap up do we want to go through what like what do we think should we be conserving individual species or do you guys see 
more like keystone species or ecosystems, flagship species? What do you guys think? I have no idea what I think. <laughs> it's too much. Well, I, okay. What I what I would say is I think we should prioritize ecosystem conservation. We should prioritize the conservation of keystone species and ecosystem engineers, but we shouldn't neglect those potentially less useful, but still very visual umbrellas. Um, mm-hmm. But at the same time, we should also know that we won't succeed every time. We will make mistakes along the way as we go forward. Not to sound like a real pessimist, I think we will lose species going forward and we should be okay with saying, okay, we, we didn't do that one. Now we have to get the next thing right and it's going to be a whole ecosystem. We're going to do the whole thing. I, I, any any more specific than that and I can't, I don't know. <laughs> I agree. I definitely am still leaning towards a being pro ecosystem specific conservation over species specific conservation and but with the kind of idea of species specific being keystone or ecosystem engineers that makes sense to me um, or an umbrella species but I think ecosystem specific conservation works best and I think that is where we should be putting our our energy I'm fine with the kind of prioritizing populations within a species more and losing populations i agree that it is inevitable we are going to lose some stuff along the way um given how things are now and it doesn't seem like it's changing quick enough for that not to be inevitable but i hope not my personal belief is i believe in the intrinsic value of all species and i think everyone has a right they all have a right to be here just as much as we do but the the realist that i am i know that that's not how it is the one thing i don't automatically agree with i don't think we should be trying to save every individual animal um i definitely look at it as a species approach i think that's probably come through if you've listened to this whole season all the way through or most of it i think it's been very obvious that, that that's where i stand i don't i'm much more conservation environmental driven than i am animal rights animal welfare and although i do obviously want animals to have good lives and i want them to to be cared for and looked after. I'm not anti-animal rights or animal welfare, but (laughs) I don't think it's realistic to try and keep every single living organism on this planet alive until they die of natural causes. I think we have to accept that that's not going to happen and we shouldn't be trying to do that because I think that diverts funding away from the real issues. I agree. So I'm definitely in favour of species-specific. Sometimes I'm more in favour of ecosystem-specific because I think you can save more species by doing that, but I'm not in favour of trying to save every single animal all the time. I think you've got to prioritise resources, especially when they're so sparse. Yeah, no, I would I would agree. And I think it with what you were just saying, Kate, it comes to that thing of, of playing God. It's a lot of these animals, especially individuals, would have gone extinct were it not for the intervention of humans. So then is it right to intervene where they would have gone extinct of natural causes? So I think you guys have kind of said everything on the I agree with the ecosystem kind of conservation side and everything but I do also think that all kind of plants and animals do have some benefit just by being there in the sense of ecosystem services that we often take for granted so plants providing oxygen we need to breathe um, all the insects that pollinate our crops the forests that regulate our climate and even things like ecotourism where you could have an animal that's not particularly useful, but it's charismatic and it's drawing people into the community and it's supporting livelihoods, enabling people to go to school, um, empowering women. Like, I think there's a lot of benefits, even if a species isn't that important in itself. Um, I think the attitude of the general public towards animals also has has a big role, I think. And I think a really nice passage to end on which I hope wasn't won't get annoyed about for copyright because I will tell you who it who wrote it and in what book they wrote it in. Um, me and Emma, I know, have definitely I think said this on like Zoology Ramblings before. It was a really nice piece and it was written by uh, Ross Barnett in his fantastic book, The Missing Links: The Past and Future of Britain's Lost Mammals. And one thing we haven't talked spoken about at all on this, aside from plants, on this episode is parasites and. The fact that you can't conserve a species without, by definition, conserving whatever is, para- well, having an impact on whatever is parasitizing on it. 
he has a chapter or a, a, a passage on the Stella's sea cow, which was an ancient Serenian, like a dugong or a manatee, which was massive. It was like six meters long, lived in the Pacific. And within, you know, I think it was a few years of human uh, encounter, humans encountering it, it was extinct. And he had this, has this really nice passage, which is a nice thing to end this episode on and a little bit of food for thought. I shall begin now. No species is an island entire of itself. Whenever a species goes extinct, its specialist parasites go with it. Stella recounts finding enormous tapeworms in the dissected entrails of the sea cow. The bark-like skin on their back was encrusted with a kind of amphipod whale louse that lived in weeping sores and was picked off by opportunistic seagulls. Who mourns for them? Which is probably something to keep in mind. We all have parasites. Emma has had one in particular, but that is a story for another time. <laughs> <laughs> I just I, I really I really like that and it, I think that is food yeah. for thought to to end definitely. on definitely um, that's a great place to end um, well yeah with that we will <laughs> see you next week um, for the finale I think so it's going to be the last I one I so um, which is very that's exciting that's crazy um, that's gone so quick <laughs> maybe we should have a bit of a party and we're doing a really positive one we're ending on a positive yes. note we've done a it's been a really hard hitting series and we're very aware of that we've definitely felt that and I think listening to it has probably been an emotional roller coaster. and so we yeah. are doing <laughs> a bet. positive end um, and talking about coexistence and how we move forward with humans and wildlife um, so make sure you are you know where to find us for that. Um, obviously, we are on YouTube as The Biome Project. We have our website, which is www.biome-project.co.uk. Uh, we're on Spotify, The Biome Podcast, Apple Podcast, The Biome Podcast, Instagram, The Biome Project. <laughs> we're everywhere. <laughs> we're, we get we're everywhere. everywhere. We're like parasites. Find, what can I say? <laughs> find us. And we're all on Instagram too. I'm at conservation underscore Kate. And Roby is Roby Watkinson Wildlife. And Emma is Emma Hodson Wildlife. And we all post loads of wildlife content. And if you want a little sneak peek at what we got up to on Mull, there's a few photos on our Instagram up there. <laughs> um, so that's just a little bit of a teaser of some more biome content to come. Um, so yeah, thank you for listening to this. I hope it's given you some food to thought. I think we've talked about a lot and not really solved anything. No, we never do. <laughs> but, but yeah, I hope it's given you some food thought and we'd love to hear what you guys think as well. So be sure to get in touch with us via any of those channels um, and we will see you next week. See you next Bye. week. Bye. Bye. <laughs>